Wes Goldberg holds open question of the day. Paolo Bancaro had a 50 piece this week. I think it goes, it's pretty obvious to me at least that that's the most impressive guy this week. He was kind of the, the big performer of the week. I think certainly some teams doing their thing as well. But I ask you this, Wes, we, we have more magic stuff to get to perhaps next week, but what is Paolo ceiling? Like, can this be a first team all NBA guy at some point? Can this be an MVP candidate at some point? Like, where are you at on the, the Paolo hype train at this point? Yeah, are you asking, can he be All-NBA at some point or All-NBA this season? Because I think uh, yeah. the latter is fairly plausible for this guy. When you're asking me about his ceiling, look, we have seen the prototype here, right? Like, this is straight out of, and I'm not making the comparison, though, but you just look at his size, LeBron James, you know, Paul George, Jason Tatum. Like, we have seen these guys either win MVPs or be on MVP ballots. That's what the ceiling is for Paolo Bancaro. He is not the passer that Tatum or or LeBron James is. And I don't know that that's ever really in his arsenal. But he has gotten out so much better and so quickly. Uh, even just this season, you've seen tremendous strides. Last year, you saw a lot of growth as a playmaker. And I think that's really the thing that unlocks him. This guy is a natural-born scorer, right? He's going to be able to get points. He reminds me of Carmelo Anthony a lot in that way. But the one thing that Melo never was able to do was unlock the passing part of his game. And you could argue right now that... Paolo Bancaro is showing so much more as a passer than, than Melo maybe ever did. And that's pretty astonishing, but I also think it's what's required of him. And, I, and that's why, by the way, I love the Orlando Magic just being like, no, we're not going to go get a point guard this year. You're going to go be the point guard. We're going to make you get good at this. And he's gotten good at it. He's gotten better at it. Um, that's really the thing that is going to determine his ceiling. Is he going to be a guy who needs somebody to play off of? Or is he going to be a guy who ultimately you could play through in big moments on a stage you know eventually like you know he he faltered in the playoffs last year against cleveland right like he was mm -hmm. not a good playmaker in that series can he grow to the point where he becomes not just a good one but an ace playmaker on in in a in a major playoff series that's going to determine his ceiling he I, i'm with you i i was looking at the numbers and prepping for this this question wes and like the and the the like dunks and threes for instance has him like relative like pretty low as far as epm goes right now like whenever that that catch-all statistic he's like in the brooke lopez siakam trey murphy zone and trey murphy's like barely played he's like to me maybe the number one guy that i just like the numbers tell you one story what you watch tells you like all these things are how i think you compile them together and paint a picture he is maybe the number one guy that I am out of that I just think he's better than what the the deep advanced nerd numbers are telling me. Like, there's no way I can't mm -hmm. look at that guy and you say he's better. I mean, to, and to your point about playmaking, his turnover percentage down this year. He's you know he's shooting maybe a little hot on the long mid mid rangers right now. He's doing really well there, but his effective field goal percentage is up. Like he looks better. He's got the size. It feels like the the leap for him is coming and it, and it feels like if there was ever was a world where to me at least i think there was at some point a debate about maybe franz would in some ways be the guy there like i think if there was a world where like his playmaking and some of that stuff like could have pushed him in a certain direction and in, in their kind of tandem i think it's just like become painfully obvious that like that is and this is the case last year i think as well but I think that is just clearly Palo. Everything goes through Palo on that team. It is all about him and, and can he be all NBA this year? Can what is his ceiling in the next six years in Orlando? And it should, right? It, everything should be built around him. That's why you take him number one. And I hear you, by the way, with the advanced stats. And here's the thing about advanced stats: they only tell you what has happened. They don't tell you what's going to happen. Like the, those dunks and threes metrics and everything like that. Palo's 21 years old. OK, mm -hmm. the reason we're so high on this guy and why we project such a bright future for this guy is based on what we've seen. He is by no means a perfect player by now. And I don't think anybody is saying that he's one of the best 10 players in the league. But that's what his ceiling is. Right. Like, I don't think either of those things is crazy to say. And, you know, it's funny, Chris, like we did this thing over at Fansided. I was involved in like one of our, our version of the top 100 player rankings. And I had Paolo w higher than all of my colleagues there. Everybody was like, look at, and, and there, you know, my colleagues there tend to be a little bit more advanced stat driven. And I'm just like, guys, like, look at what's this guy's like, actually watch these games. Look at what this guy is doing. I'm sorry. Like, I don't care about the advanced stats with this guy. This guy is an advantage creator. He's a game changer. He's a, to me, a big moment guy. I, I, this guy just has all the intangibles. I'm, I could not be more in on Paolo Bencaro. I, I'm, I'm very excited by what we've seen so far. I will, I will give you a take that's adjacent to this, Ted, before we get into the main thrust of the show, Wes. I 
am, and I say this as someone who uses advanced stats in my analysis, who relies on them to, and they're, they're an incredibly useful tool to be sure. comfortable using. I think sometimes we get to a point with some of these things where because there's there's this need for us, the quote unquote us, to have a take on everything, that advanced stats can be just become a crutch when you don't have time to get all the way to something. It feels like something like that with Palo. It's just like you got to watch it a little bit more to, to actually. It's, it's such a great point. And not a lot of people are watching the Orlando Magic or have it, but they, <laughs> you better. It's time to start watching them. Yeah, they are for real. West, a lot of teams in the West for real. I'm excited to, like, in two weeks to, like, do an East check-in. I'm very excited for Cleveland-Milwaukee on Saturday. Feels like a big game that Milwaukee kind of needs. A lot of good stuff already happening in the East. But on today's show, we're going to a team that has struggled in the East so far. That is our beloved Detroit Pistons. We're going to talk about the L.A. Lakers again. And we're, I have a take about Mike Budenholzer being the key to what is going right in Phoenix right now. That is all coming up today on the Just basketball show let's go what is up everyone welcome into the just basketball show please follow rate review on your podcast at platform of choice i'm chris manning that is wes goldberg hit subscribe on the just basketball fans youtube channel if you have not already and find us on tiktok instagram and x and west you're going to tell us about our friends at bet mgm yeah that's right if you haven't signed up for bet mgm yet use the bonus code just basketball you're going to get up to fifteen hundred dollars in first bet offers on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's how it works. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android and sign up using the code JUSTBASKETBALL. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game, and you'll receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if that bet loses. Just make sure to, the bonus, to use the bonus code JUSTBASKETBALL when you sign up. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Must be 21 or older to wager. Terms and conditions apply. Wes, let's dive in. Take number one for me. It's about our beloved Pistons, and it's that Kid Cunningham and the Detroit Pistons are actually on the right track. I have watched three of their games so far. I have I saw them in person when they played a pretty they played pretty well against Cleveland for the most part, even though the game got out of hand late. They're one and four. And that's not good. I don't think they're happy with one and four. I don't think anyone to have, you know, one let fewer win than the Washington Wizards who are five hundred right now would make anyone happy. But they're twentieth in net rating. They were 29th last year. Early, but Cleveland the Glass has them as the league's worst expected win differential based on their net rating. I think that's, that's a positive sign. And I, Wes, I think Cade is doing everything you would want him to do. The key here for them to turn this around and I think become a closer to 500 team and just a more functional team that can win more games, it's about Cade doing the one thing he hasn't done well this year, which is cut down on turnovers. He has an 18, he has the what would be the highest turnover percentage of his career. It is up nearly 6% from last year. It is 2% higher than his rookie year, which is his worst year from a turnover perspective. He has talked about this in the media. If if Cade cuts down on the turnovers, the Pistons will immediately get better. There is a clear path here by that one simple thing with the, all the other changes they've made and what J.B. Bickerstaff is doing, Wes, to get this team moving in the right direction. They're already moving in the right direction, but to fully solidify that approach, it's all about Cade Cunningham cutting down on his turnovers. So a lot to get into here, but first of all, two things. I love the jacket today. Um, Shout out, homage, baby. This is an homage Guardian starter jacket. We're out here repping, you know, our sponsors. We love it. I'm gonna have to explore the uh, starter jacket uh, stuff. Although I do live in Miami and I have very little use for jackets. Yeah. But do you have like two days a year where you can wear a jacket? Can like, I cut me, the sleeves like, off? Yeah. <laughs> you, should, you could go like Stone Cold Steve Austin. You got to find like a jean one that you just like. Yeah, we got to get you a cut off. That'd be good. I think that'd be a good look for you. I also love that we both have seen our flag planted team already within the first week and a half of the season. Yep. I've also seen the Detroit We're Pistons in person and came away very impressed. And so um, a little peek behind the curtain here. When you tell me what your take is going to be, all your te- like before as we're preparing for the show, yeah. you're just telling me I got Pistons. I'm like, okay, my take cannot deal with the Pistons. I was a little worried, especially on your tees in the cold open, that you were going to be down on the, our team. Mm-mm. And Mm-mm. I'm very excited that you're telling me that you're up on the team, that you're high on the team, despite the record, despite you know the win loss stuff, because um, I'm there with you. And maybe this doesn't make for great radio because we're not necessarily disagreeing here, but I am tremendously 
optimistic about what it is that the Detroit Pistons are doing. I am a little concerned about our over under bet on 25 and a half. Wins, oh yeah, absolutely. They, that that's they, that's a huge concern. We got to get over the hump on that, but that was more of just us putting our uh, money where our mouth is. I don't know how much confidence we actually had in that one, but yeah. I look at even just their their point differential and not even net ratings and these fancy things that you're talking about on cleaning the glass. They lost games. They uh, they lost games by an average of nine and one nine and a half, sorry nine point one points per game last year. They were outscored on average by nine points per game last year. They're being outscored this year by four point four points per game. That's improvement. That's almost twice. That's basically twice as good as they were last year, despite the fact that they're losing these games. But you watch them and you're like. No, this team can't be taken lightly. This is not a team that if you see them on your schedule, you're like, all right, cool, circle that. We're walking over them. You got to compete. Like, Cade Cunningham is here to play. Jay and Ivy looks like a different player based oh, yeah. on uh, under J.B. Bickerstaff than what he is on, under Monty Williams. Is he still averaging 20 points per game? Because he was after the first couple games of the year. So, yeah, he's he's got really good splits right now. I'm gonna pull, I'll pull them up and we'll get to them. But, like, he's looked he looks like a player whose coach actually believes in him now, which, you know, was not the case with Monty Williams. Yeah, he's at 21. he's at 21.2 points. Uh, 3.6 assists, 4.4 rebounds. I think Bickerstaff has come in there and that really established uh, organization there. And I think that's really important with this team is they just seemed so disorganized last year. It was basically Cade Cunningham, go out there and please just do all of it. Save us. You have all the organization. You're the point guard. Y'all figure it out. And Cade's young, right? He missed a whole season. Like This is not a guy who at this stage in his career can be the guy who figures it all out. He needs some sort of organizing principles. And you're starting to see it there. I, I think Bickerstaff has done a really good job of making sure that the roster has inherent spacing issues. He's optimized it. He's done the most with the the little amount that he has. Like always mm -hmm. one of Tim Hardaway Jr., Malik Beasley, Simon Fantecchio, like his spacers, like his quote unquote spacers. At least one of them is always on the court. Some, most of the time, two of them. I think that's great. I think having Jaden Ivey play on the ball is really uh, smart because it gets Cade Cunningham off the ball a little bit more, gives him a little bit of break. I watched him score like 20 points, 22 points in the first half against the Miami Heat the other night. That guy, when he gets going, is 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 as good as anybody. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like the Ron Holland stuff that we've seen from him as an energy guy off the bench. There's just a lot to like there. I like a lot of their young players. Uh, we still haven't seen them fully optimized with Asar Thompson, who I think is going to change a lot for their team in a good way, mm -hmm. right? They still are missing that one sort of premium defender who can really kind of make plays on the defensive end and turn stops into scores and transition and stuff like that. Um, and once you get him back, yeah, maybe, maybe some of these close losses start swinging into wins because he's one of those guys who can just sort of uh, create a couple of swing plays and a couple of extra possessions and, and scores out of nothing over the course of a game. So of all these young players who, and, and let's maybe subtract Cade Cunningham just because yeah. he's sort of the number one pick and obvious, who are you most excited by? So, Wes, I'll say one quick thing about uh, Oscar Thompson. He is coming back from a blood clot, and I think when he comes back, that will obviously be interesting and good for them. But I think giving him, like, I would, ex because his season ended last year because of this blood clot, he, he's had this long road back. I think a month, it, it's like we're going to have to give him some leeway, I think, before we say, okay, he's should we keep playing or not. I, ho I hope totally there's fair. real patience with him. There will be on our part, and we are the most, the, they are the loudest Pistons fans that matter right now. So That's right. I'm, I, Ivy's the obvious answer, but the guy in person, Wes, that really popped for me was Jalen Duran. I okay. thought the feistiness he played with, I thought the aggressiveness he played with going at Jared Allen, contesting shots, going at Evan Mobley. I just have always quite, I've always really liked him as a prospect. He's still pretty young, but I thought the energy he played with, the, the aggression he played with, he's shooting 85% this year on twos. He's just been absolutely incredibly efficient, more better than he's ever been. You know, he's not shooting nearly as much, which is kind of an interesting development. His shots have been more than cut in half from a year ago, which is interesting. Um, his minutes a little bit down, but I think the way he's been aggressive on defense, the way he is still rebounding at a good clip, the way he's, he's contesting shots right now. I've loved what I've seen from Jalen Duran so far this year. Yeah. Being the new Deandre Jordan, is something that I love for him. You know, like if that's just <laughs> yeah. what he is, that's great. Uh, a premium rebounder, a guy who just makes everything because everything he takes is a foot from the basket or at the basket or above the basket. And that's totally fine. He is enormous in person, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's listed at 6'10, 250. It feels like he's seven foot and all 250 pounds are just pure sculpted muscle, right? Like mm -hmm. he's a statue that looked better than the one that was actually in front of Kaseya Center. 
when I saw him in person. So it was, I, yeah, that, that it's a great call out. If I'm going to answer my own question, and I have, and I like Jalen Duran, I remain high on him, even though I think the first couple of years for him were a little rough. I, I still am high on yes. him. Yes, Mike. I, if I, I'm going to take Osar Thompson off the table, um, but I feel like I don't. Ha- you know what? Why would I do that? No, that's my answer. I mean, Osar Thompson. I mean, he hasn't played though. I mean, that's kind of the thing. You know? I just loved his. I loved his yeah. rookie year. I love both Thompson twins for the record. But I think, yeah, choosing between the two, I don't know. I think maybe Amen Thompson is the one that gets more love, and people say mm-hmm. might be better defensively. I don't know. Just anecdotally, I felt like Asar Thompson was a little bit better defensively. I just might have been watching his best defensive games. I think that guy can is going to be on all defensive teams multiple times in his career, and I think there's a very valuable thing in the NBA uh, that maybe isn't being covered enough in this age of three point shooting. And that's the ability to create turnovers. Um, I think is, and and, uh, Jared Dubin pointed this out in his newsletter this week. And I thought it was a very interesting article about how, okay, like, yeah, the Houston Rockets during the James Harden era figured it out and it was all about three point shooting and, and increasing your margins via more three point shots, fewer mid range shots, just get those threes up, man. And uh, and the rest of the league is caught up. And, and now you look at the margins and there's, most teams are shooting, most successful teams, I should say, are shooting a lot of threes. And so when everybody's shooting a lot of threes, then you have to find different margins or different ways to create margins, right? Uh, uh, advantages via the math. And one of the ways to do that is just increase, take away threes from the other team and create more threes for yourself. And how do you, the way you do that is live ball turnovers. Asar Thompson averaged one and a half uh, 1.1 steals per game last season. He gets He's a deflection machine. He's one of those guys who I think can swing a handful of half a dozen possessions per game. And having those guys I think is tremendously valuable where this NBA is going. So I love Asar Thompson. I'm I'm all in on that guy. Also, I Jaden Ivey is one of my guys. He's one, he's one of my guys in that draft. And it was not looking great for me uh, last year, but I'm glad that um, we've got a little bit... Um, uh, uh, um, better performances from him this year. And it feels like uh, his career got on the right track is on the right track at least. Yeah. I, it feels like he just is playing with a a sense of confidence and belief that just was not there before. And that that's a really, really big deal. Where are you at on Kate? He is for the year again, turn the ball a little bit more, but he's scoring efficiently. He's taking slightly more threes. He's cut down on some of the mid range. He's definitely the lead guy on that team. When you watch them play everything, when he is on the floor really is running through him first and foremost he's setting everybody up he's scoring when he feels like he can where are you at on Kate at this current moment he's such an interesting player isn't he because you watch him and you're like wow this guy looks like everything you'd want out of your lead point guard right he's uh right out of that Luka Doncic sort of Ben Simmons when he was good uh type of school where it's just like hey big enormous playmaker who can make every pass on the court and then you look at some of his stats and you're like why is his assist to turnover ratio aggressively bad uh, for somebody that was supposed to be able to read the court in an elite level uh, coming out of college. What is, what's up with this pull-up three-point shooting game with him? Like, he's, a, he's, he's pretty streaky as a shooter, basically from everywhere on the court. He really struggles, despite his size, to finish at the basket. Um, he, he had more, I think I, I, he had almost as, I think he was second in, in shots blocked per game last season. Like, this guy gets a lot of his shots blocked. So, you'd wish that there was a little bit more feel for scoring around the basket and a little bit more feel for the game in terms of a passer, but his highlights are incredible and he looks the part. It's just when you kind of dive into the stats, you're like, yeah, there's definitely room for improvement in pretty major ways, right? Like you could actually make the argument that he's not that good of a basketball player yet um, based on some of these advanced stats. So, and they're not even advanced stats. These are just ratios and box score things that we're talking about here. So, and percentages, but, um, I am a Cade Cunningham guy. I'm a Cade Cunningham fan. I just, I think what Bickerstaff has done to take him off the ball a little bit more has been smart because I do think if we are expecting Cunningham to be this Luka Doncic type of creator um, where you could basically build everything around him and make him the hub of all of you, everything you do offensively, I think you're going to be disappointed. I think that's going to be a mistake. I don't think that's what Cade Cunningham's best. I don't think that's the optimized version of Cade Cunningham. I, I, I just don't think that that's there for him. Um, yeah, but he can be a very good and, and lead kind of player. I just think he needs to play with somebody else who can create. Right. And you've even seen this with Luca. Like once you add Kyrie Irving to the mix, how much easier it is on him. Cade Cunningham is nowhere near Luca and won't ever be, but 
you, if you surround him with a little bit more playmaking and a little bit more space, I think you're just going to make things a lot easier on him. And he could be one of your main cogs in an offense. He might be something more similar to like what Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown is to Boston, where you could do a lot of it, but you don't have to do all of it. And that's fine. You can win a lot of games that way, especially when you're big and, and bring a lot of the other things to the table the way the Cade does. Yeah, like, and, and, you know, to defend him for, and I'm not saying you're picking him, but it's like, if people are saying, oh, he he's he shouldn't play like Luka, it's like, there's there's one guy in the world that really should play like Luka, and that's Luka. Like, there's mm-hmm. no one really else you would you would trust. Don't tell that to James it. Harden. Well, Pete James Harden could do it as well, but I don't know if I would want. Uh, Prime James it. Harden's trying to do it now. He's like, hey, look, work for Luka, I can keep doing that. Sorry, didn't, yeah. I didn't mean to no, do that. It's okay. The, the Clippers also are in pulling someone who definitely doesn't belong in the NBA roster. So so weird times out with the Clippers at the the bathroom list, the, the heavy bathroom filled fan wall into yeah. a dome. Um, would like to go to that arena, but alas, I'm I'm bullish on Kate again. I really think if he just cuts on the turnovers, which like I believe he will, just because it feels like he is being so aggressive right now and just trying to get everything to work. It's like, and it's just out of characteristic for him from last year and, and being just year four in the league. I just don't think he's going to be this heavy turnover guy at a pretty similar usage to where he's been. I think it'll normalize. And I think that solves a lot of this. I know that's really simple, like take care of the basketball, but that is just like the easiest thing they could do that. And like Tobias Harris, just not shooting like 18% from three. And this team immediately probably wins one or two more games out of this (laughs) opening stretch. Yeah, look, I mean, you can make the argument that Cade has not played in an organized offense before this. And so with as much cramped, as little space as he had, of course he was going to turn the ball over a bunch. But he's playing in more space now, and he's never turned the ball over more, which is a little concerning for me. 7.4 assists to 5.6 turnovers per game. I need to see growth on that end, but I am with you. I, I am bullish on Cade Cunningham. To me, it's a little bit similar to what we were talking about with Paolo. I know what the stats say. I also know that my eyes, I like a lot of what I see. And if he just cleans up some of the, like the, it just trims the fat on his game a little bit more. I, I think this guy could take a major leap, like almost like, pretty quickly. Like I think this guy could become an all-star almost overnight, as long, but he's, if he can trim the fat and, and like the bad tasting fat, not like the good fat that you get in like a prime ribeye. Like you got to cut that out the turnovers and the inefficiencies and getting blocked at the rim. You cut that out. I think the sky's the limit for that guy. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Up next, Wes, we are going to get to your take on the LA Lakers who did just have a disappointing loss in person, but Bronny did get his first points. Interesting night for them in Cleveland uh, on Wednesday, but first got to tell you about our friends at eBay. eBay has been a fantastic partner of the Just Sports Podcast Network this year, partnering with Just Baseball, which I kind of should be a host of with this jacket, on three incredible events from spring training to the All-Star Game to Wild Card Weekend. And we want to shout out their new Game Time Gets collection, along with career benchmarks, lead-wide records, and single-game achievements that will trigger them to drop at ebay.com backslash Game Time Gets. With bidding for each card starting at $0.24 cents as an homage to basketball's 24-second shot clock, tons of great cards over at ebay.com backslash game time gets. I mean, Victor Wembanyama having a game this year, Wes, with three blocks and three three-pointers just feels like a lock to happen. And you're, that card's going to hit there, and you're going to you're gonna want that card, even though uh, check out the much better Wemby the other night in, in that highly anticipated matchup. You know, Shea hitting his, his 2,000 career assists. Your favorite player is going to be featured on there, so go check this out at ebay.com backslash game time gets. Wes, what's your Lakers take? JJ Redick is a good coach. Yeah, I look, I, I, you, you said it before that us agreeing is is not good, you know, podcasting. He's absolutely a good coach, and oh, I don't no. want to do. No, here's the thing, I, I'm not full like Lakers fan glazing about like every time you see like a Lakers fan tweeting about this, and they're like, oh man, he just communicates, and like every little thing he does is like an A plus in the language they're using. But just like I was watching him a bunch on the sideline the other night. And even in the fourth quarter, when they're, like, going to lose the game, Bronny's in, don't connect's, like, the main guy on the offense. He is, like, so anal about, like, what they're doing to make sure they're doing it correctly. And it's, like, to me, as, as an outsider looking in and not talking about it, like, the way he is detail-oriented and just, like, so insane about this stuff, that, to me, is, like, what makes some of the best coaches the best coaches. I want a coach who's absolutely a zealot about this stuff and it feels like JJ Reddick's an absolute zealot about all the little stuff, which which bodes really well for him. 
Yeah, being insane is a pretty good prerequisite for being a good head coach, isn't it? Like that's you gonna, look at, that, that's a, that's your pull quote, by the way, for this. I'm, <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm making that. <laughs> Go ahead, type it up. Um, okay. Eric Spolstra, Joe Missoula, like these guys are like insane. Well, like, jo- these guys jo- are jo- bananas, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, jo- Joe Missoula legitimately says something once a week that I'm just like, what, like I once in a while, what? This is not the point, and so I don't mean to do this, but I have to do it because it just popped into my head now. Once a week, I'm Instagram feed. I get the clip when someone asked him, "Did you talk to the royal family?" And he says, "Jesus, Mary, and Joseph." And he's like, "Dead, dead ass serious." And I'm like, "This guy's brain is locked in." And then all the quotes about like the the soccer, I, he's an absolute nut. I don't know I how like. he doesn't laugh after some of these because he knows he's a meme. Like he knows he's trolling guys. I, like, you know, I don't know if he knows he's a meme. Like I think at a certain point you're just like unaware. You know? Okay. Well, whatever it is, uh, JJ Redick is, I think, a little unaware of how intense he comes off of, and that's fine. That's okay. Like you should be intense in that coach. But here's my point with JJ Redick is. He said he was going to do something, and then he went ahead and did it. And it's only like a week and a half into the season, so it doesn't mean that all this stuff is going to carry through. But I love that it's only a week and a half into a season, and we're already seeing a huge difference between last year's Lakers and this year's Lakers. And I think one of the things that we mistake a lot in the NBA, in in professional sports uh, for that record, um, it's really hard to change your identity without changing your personnel. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. When you, when you basically have the same roster outside of Dalton Connect, who's the rookie they drafted, and Bronny James, who's the other rookie they drafted, in case you haven't heard of him, um, then it's just, it's very difficult to just kind of change everything that you do. But you hear coaches all the time talk about this at media day. We want to play faster. We want to get more threes. We want to do this. We want to do that. We want to be better defensively. We're really going to dial in. Whatever. Well, J.J. Redick, early in the season, the Lakers are 3-2. and two. I know they just dropped two straight, but I'm not worried about it. I love how pissed off he was after that Phoenix Suns loss. And how he yeah. was accountable for it, unlike Darvin Ham last year, that would be like, oh, well, we were really injured. And you're like, okay, dude, so, like, welcome to the NBA. Every team's injured sometimes. Yeah. Um, he said that they wanted to increase their rebounding percentage. They did. They did. They were 29th in rebounding percentage last year. They're 15th right now, where they their rebounding percentage right now would have ranked 6th last year. And they were 29th last year. That changed overnight. Same personnel. Um, he said he wanted to play through Anthony Davis. We've heard that before from Lakers coaches. None of them did it. J.J. Redick has done it. Anthony Davis is averaging 30 points per game. That's third in the NBA. I mean, this guy is in line for the scoring title, the way that he's playing. His usage rating is way up. So it's not just the points. Like, the, you watch his Lakers games, and the offense is flowing through Anthony Davis. I think the fact that they won a game the other night that LeBron James scored, what was it, 11 points or something? Almost had his double-digit point thing uh, record uh, snapped. His streak snapped at like a billion games or whatever it is. Um, the fact that they still won that game with Anthony Davis playing the way that he played. Did they win that game? I'm trying to remember. I'm getting all my games confused. The it's game okay. There's our, we're, we've already hit the game metrics. Like this, I, I always tell myself it doesn't happen until later in the year. Two weeks of the NBA season, you're just dizzy keeping track of everything. They lost the game. So I'm much. sorry. That was the, yeah, okay, that was yeah. the Phoenix game that they lost by four points. But... The fact that they were even in that game on a night where LeBron James was playing like that, no LeBron James is ever in that game. No, I'm sorry, no LeBron James team is in that game if he scores 11 points on that kind of shooting performance. It's never, one of his worst performances of his career, shooting-wise. But yep. they were because of the fact that they are playing through Anthony Davis and they have narrowed the margins that were so wide open last year. Everybody wondered, how were the Lakers so bad last year when you got a healthy and all-NBA caliber season from LeBron James and Anthony Davis? It's because they sucked at everything else. That's why. You just got to narrow the margins where you don't suck at all that other stuff. And J.J. Redick has come in and done that. That, to me, is good coaching. That's what it is. We know what you're getting from LeBron James. We know essentially what you're getting from Anthony Davis. It's figuring out a system that wasn't in place last year, the right rotations. And then beyond all that, just stuff on the court. I think this team really enjoys playing for J.J. Redick. It I feels think this like team it. believes in JJ. I think when they when JJ Reddick talks, I think they believe that guy is prepared and that what whatever he says is going to be better for us. So we're going to listen to him. And I've heard it now a couple of times that I think one of the hardest things that a coach has to do is get his players to buy in. And I agree with that. I think that probably is the hardest thing. It's I think a lot of coaches get a lot of shine for the cool like ATOs that they draw up and whatever. And that whole stuff is is fun and, and important. Nothing more important than getting buy-in from your guys. And the fact that they didn't buy in on Darvin Ham's whatever coaching last year might have been fine. You know, it turns out that maybe he wasn't a great coach. But the fact that they're buying in on what JJ Redick is selling right away is 
very powerful and I think is one of the reasons why I think we have to think of the Lakers a little bit differently. And I am saying this off of two straight losses. So that was a long monologue, Chris. I apologize for going long on it. But okay. I've been very impressed with J.J. Redick so far. Can I tell you when I was full? Like the uh, Here's the thing that made, I'm just going to tell you. We're on a podcast. I don't know why I'm setting it up like that. That was dumb. That was bad can podcast. I, can I talk to you on this podcast? Yeah, can I talk to you on this podcast? Um, the moment I became pretty into Redick as a coach is did, did you see the clip where LeBron gets to the, the shot clock violation and JJ says shoot the fucking ball yep the coaches that have had the most success with LeBron to date are Tyron Lue and Eric Spolstra Frank Vogel is in this I think as well although like that wore one out for, but for, for, did get fired it, so it's a, it's, it's a weird it, one. It, yeah and it wore out for whatever reason but I think when LeBron has a coach who goes at him, it works. The part of the reason, I think the number one reason like the David Blatt thing did not work is because David Black could ne never felt like he could really challenge LeBron. There was never an equal footing. Right. There was never, LeBron, like, despite like carrying a lot of weight and holding a lot of power, I think he does like to be coached. He does like to, to be pushed. He'd like someone to challenge him. Ty Lue was great at that. I think Ty Lue coming in and like, not really changing a ton, but really like being able to push that locker room and push LeBron on down, change that 16 calf season. I think going to in Miami, I think LeBron would, t he has called it his college years. He'd call that mm -hmm. the years he grew up. That is because of Eric Spolstra. That is because of Pat Riley. That is because of the culture that is set in that organization. That was not there with Darvin Ham. It felt like the last couple of years that it was just kind of listless and there was not a lot of really like, it was like LeBron, the LeBron show. There's obviously always going to be elements of that because he's LeBron James, or you know, arguably the greatest player ever, the the biggest ambassador the league has right now. But JJ Redick can push him, and there's like there is like a there is a mending of the ways. It's almost like if we go back to like them doing the that, that the mining the game pod together, Wes. It's not that like it it wasn't a precursor that LeBron was just going to get to tell JJ what to do. It's that he actually gives a fuck about what's coming out of JJ's mouth. And if you get if you can get LeBron to buy into what's coming out of your mouth, that's like half the battle of being an effective coach for LeBron. The other stuff you have to do well too. JJ is nailing all that so far. You've hit that absolutely right. But I think it starts and then gets more likely to be effective because he's willing to be to have that tête à tête with LeBron. Yeah, and you don't just get that you have to earn it and the way you earn it is not by pushing lebron it's not by holding him accountable necessarily it's by earning his respect there's few people who have ever known the game of basketball better than lebron james right and i think jj reddick doing that podcast maybe lebron james already knew it and that's why he agreed to do the podcast with jj reddick and take time out of his season to do that um but i think it's very clear by him doing that podcast that he uh, he respects jj reddick's basketball iq that they can like you said, go tit for tat on just basketball stuff on, hey, I think we need to uh, switch this specific screen and roll. And JJ Reddick would be like, you know what? No, I don't think we we should because X, Y, and Z. And LeBron James will listen to him. I think that's been clear. And so when JJ does try to hold LeBron James accountable and does try to coach him and the rest of the team, LeBron James is going to listen, right? And obviously he didn't respect Darvin Ham's basketball knowledge or the way that he coached or the, or whatever it was. Clearly, you know what, I, and I probably shouldn't even say that, but that's just that's sort of the inference that we're it's, getting it, it based on all the reporting like coming out of like, it, exactly. So it feels like it exactly. But he clearly, clearly respects JJ Redick. Now we have seen LeBron James change how he feels about coaches in the past. I don't think that's going to happen with JJ Redick, but you should always just keep the door open with LeBron James, I, I suppose. But um, so far, I think Redick's done a great job, and and if. You know, this is a team that a couple of years ago did go to the Western Conference Finals. And you look at the Western Conference right now, and, you know, you got the Oklahoma City Thunder at the very top. Do you feel That's... awesome about any of these other teams? Like, no. You know, Dal don't. Dallas looks good. I shouldn't, you know, Dallas looks good. But, like, you know, beyond those two teams, I'm not, like, feeling great about some of these other contending teams that we thought, right? Like, you know, it's not been great well, for Denver, to say the least. Like, uh, Minnesota is kind of going through their growing pains and all this other... Uh, M Memphis doesn't look like the juggernaut that we thought they might be able to return to. I, I think the... We in other words, I think the Western Conference is pretty open. And mm -hmm. there's no reason why the Lakers can, they can't break through it. They've got two top 10 players in LeBron James and Anthony Davis. They're well coached. They do need... And I guess the next part of this would be what comes next. 
The backup center position for them is a mess. Jackson Hayes ain't it. Yeah. No, he's it not. It feels good. like he's a D'Angelo Russell enough. trade has to happen if they yep. want to take this season seriously. And so what can you do on those margins? Can you get another one or two rotation guys? I think that could help them in a major way here. Um, I don't know what that move is, and they have some time to figure that out, obviously. Yeah, and I, I look at Connect as like an example of just where they need to improve. I think there were some hopes for him coming in as a shooter and just like an impact media guy. I mean, I saw from a betting perspective, he had like pretty long odds at Bet MGM and other places. I saw some people, there was like a, some tickets on him and some long shot cases made for him as like a sneaky rookie of the year candidate or like a top three to five finish. I, I saw that analysis and I understood it. You know, this is really based on seeing him in person, but he looks like an he looks like a rookie who's really learning how to play at this level right now. Mm-hmm. And at some point, if you're a, a really good team, can you afford you know him messing up on defense and looking out of position? Can you afford him, you know, like struggling a little bit to find his exact spots in the offense? Like I think those I think are all can. valid questions that are going to come. I think you can right now, and by the yes. playoffs, you hope he's not doing that as much. And and I do think that they need to play him. I think they need to throw him into the fire and figure it out because Max Christie has not been the guy they hoped he would be. Um, they mm-hmm. just declined the option on, option on Jalen Hood Shafino. So they clearly don't feel good about those guys. I think they do feel good about Connect. And J.J. Redick is using Connect in really interesting ways. Like He's bringing back like the that floppy action, kind of Spain pick and roll stuff that he used to run all the time as a player. And it's just so easy to just drop Connect into those actions. And when you have somebody that could do that paired with Anthony Davis and LeBron James, it, it's symbi- it's symbiotic for everybody. It's just it's a natural basketball event. It just works. And so, I, yeah, I think play him a lot, get him ready. Maybe that's one other guy you have, but I would be seriously looking at some trades for them. Like if you can get a serious backup center, and I know that they've been linked to Jonas Valanciunas, and that's I don't know based on stuff that I'm hearing, that's still the number one option for them is to go get that guy. If you can get him, come off the bench. You can even play him in lineups in certain matchups with Anthony Davis if you're going up against Jokic or whoever it might be. I think that would be a great get for them. And if you can get one other guard that you could just feel good about throwing out there, um, you know, I know that they're working Gabe Vincent back and maybe that's ultimately, it. but even then you would still probably need one other guard, mm-hmm. uh, a guy who could maybe break somebody down off the dribble, but then not give up everything defensively that D'Angelo Russell gives up. I think that would be key. Yeah. And, the, you know, look at Jared Vanderbilt back at some point or his salary yep. using a trade. Like, I mean, he's, he's kind of a funky offensive fit, I think at times. Yeah. For I think Reddick wants to do. But that that's a salary you could use in trade. I think there's a lot of flexibility there. And I am more I am much more into Lakers now West than I was coming into the season. I feel much more optimistic about like what they could be this year than I think I was coming into the year. That's that's really where I've fallen on this. And it's look, Reddick there's a lot of credit for that. They do. Um yeah, if I'm the Lakers, maybe I call the Wizards and I say Jonas Allen Judas and Malcolm Brogdon. Yeah, I don't hate it, you know. And yeah. I think you know, you know, and how much they want to you know, mortgage the future for this year, maybe next year is an open question, but uh, I I think they're set up now. Like with the, whatever LeBron like goes this year, probably after next year would be my guess. Like the, the, it, the early returns are good, but like an, a, I'm more a, a JJ Redick, Anthony Davis era sounds like kind of interesting to me, honestly. Like I'm kind of into whatever that could be for the next couple of years, you know, like they they feel like they hack. Like I know all this, the, there's blasphemous stuff about, you know, like Jake, like I would say, maybe not blasphemous, but really hype, like hyperbole about how people were talking about JJ as like this, like this, the figure he was going to be. As I can't remember the exact name that was that was brought up with him. Pat but Riley. It just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pat Riley. You, of course, yeah. But it feels like they have something in him that it's like I couldn't envision Darvin Ham coaching the Lakers beyond LeBron. Like if they. had... Like if he had stuck around, I couldn't imagine him lasting another year. I can imagine mm. JJ like actually lasting in this job based on on how it's gone so far. Yeah, which totally. was not a given, not a given. No, it, because between him and LeBron and AD, I mean, you got LeBron and AD, two future Hall of Famers. LeBron, greatest player of all time. They're also responsible for setting sort of the culture of what the next version of the Lakers is, right? And I think that's. And if you have them buying into what J.J. Redick is selling, then again, like everybody who comes into that organization after LeBron James eventually leaves and is coached by J.J. Redick, they're going to have to say, if it was good enough for LeBron, it's going to be good enough for me, right? It's hard, to, it's hard to claim otherwise. And you can even tell with somebody who has earned the reputation of being hard to coach, like in D'Angelo Russell. You're seeing D'Angelo Russell kind of take to J.J. Redick a little bit here too. 
right? Like you, there's, I don't know, whatever. It's, it's Lakers social media putting it out, so take it for what it's worth. But, you know, moments of J.J. Reddick coaching D'Angelo Russell pretty hard, and, and D'Lo seems pretty open to it, right? And D'Lo's a really yeah. smart guy. I don't think yeah. he gets enough credit for that. I've, I've, you know, I've written features on him. I got to know him a little bit. But, um, yeah, I, I think he's also stubborn in the way that he plays. But um, Or maybe fixed in his ways is probably a better way to put that. Uh, but JJ has has gotten a little bit more out of him, but I do think that eventually they'll probably have to move on. I did. Uh, I did also like the clip of JJ Redick defending Jackson Hayes in the post that was going around the other day. That was that made me that made me laugh. Just forty. Yeah, that's JJ always Redick. that's always a good uh, first year yeah. coach tactic. Is no, 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 let me uh, let me get in there and scrap with you a little bit. Particularly when you're not like like in your fifties or sixties, you know, when it's like would not, not advise entirely. on that. Yeah, but when yeah, you're JJ yeah. and. You, it, uh, you still got the arm sleeve and, and you're still pretty fit. Yeah, maybe you could pull yeah. it off a little bit. Hope, hope he and Kenny. Off. I forgot JJ had all those tats. I kind of forgot about that. Yeah, it's funny because you have to wear either the um, the the quarter zip or the sweater as a coach, and and nobody very rarely do you see anybody roll those sleeves up. I'm a big sleeve roll up guy. Maybe that's yeah. again me just being in South Florida, but I have a hard time keeping the sleeves all the way down on anything. Um, and I'm surprised that more coaches don't roll up the sleeves on stuff, but it's cold in these arenas. Anyway, this is not important. Um, you don't see him flashing the tattoos as much now that he's a head coach. Yeah. All right, before we get to the last thing, which is going to be about Mike Budenholzer and Bradley Beal, i got to tell you about our friends at Homage. Homage is the ultra-comfortable specialty apparel company with NBA and WNBA licenses that uses vintage-inspired designs to pay homage to the greatest stories, traditions, and figures across sports, music, and popular culture. Use the link below to make your purchase and support the Just Basketball Show. They also have their awesome starter jackets. They have a ton of NFL ones. I'm wearing the Cleveland Guardian starter jacket right now. It is super warm. It's super comfortable. I cannot wait for fall baseball next year. I ordered this when it, you know, they had a, a random sale one day when I was looking at it, and I got it, and I can't wait to wear this during some fall baseball for the There's Cleveland Guardians. There's a 20% off year. sale going on right now. I'm on the website yeah. looking for the uh, my starter jacket. Yeah, go get a good starter jacket. Buy all their great stuff. They have a great uh, WNBA Finals collection if you're a New York Liberty fan. So go check that out. Use the link below. Support the Just Basketball Show. Wes, the Phoenix Suns. You mentioned the West being open. I just want to note one thing. They are at BetMGM. They are plus 1,000 to win the West, plus 2,000 to win the title. I'm not saying that I overly believe in the Phoenix Suns, but I also believe that it's more possible the Phoenix Suns have a run in them than I did coming into the season. And I think Bradley Beal and how he's using, how Mike Budenholzer is using him kind of explains the whole thing here. Bradley Beal right now is taking the by far the highest percentage of his shots for his career from three. He is absolutely letting it rip from three right now. I think 49% of his shots are coming from behind the arc. That is, you know, a, a very, very high number. He's never been above 40% in his career. And this roster, with the way they remade it in the summer, even when it was last year, this just always felt like it should... This, this roster should feels like it should have always been coached by Mike Budenholzer and not Frank Vogel. Mm. That is not to, to besmirch Vogel, who's been a, a very good head coach for a long time, I think could be one again, obviously has won a, won a title. But this feels like a team that always just should have been coached by Bud. It looks right now. They're flowing. I think, the, again, the way they got Royce O'Neal last year and, and the way they redid their bench this offseason is a big deal that. But I think if you just look at how Beal is playing, the way he's being used and the, the comfort he looks in right now, I think it tells a story about how this team is a different version than it was last year. And if it keeps trending like this, I do think there's there's something here to watch with the Phoenix Suns. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the Bradley Beal point because it's such a good one. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about, J.J. Redick. Um, it's, hey, can you get your guys to buy in? Specifically, can you get your stars to buy in? And I did have my questions about drop Mike Boonholzer into this situation with Tyus Jones, and, who's getting paid a minimum salary, and is a coach who's been out of the league for a year, and a point guard on a minimum salary going to be enough to change the habits that veterans like Bradley Beal, Kevin Durant, and Devin Booker have built up over the years and the answer at least so far this season has been yes you know and the Bradley Beal thing is a great uh, he's a great avatar who kind of represents all this yeah 47 and a half percent of his shots like you said coming from three-point range by far a career high he was at 32 percent last year um which the, insane the by the way like it's like that's an insane like even if he is not a great like lights out three-point shooter for someone who is the third banana on a team who plays in the perimeter 
that is an insanely low number by modern NBA standards for him to be that low. That's like that's about practice on on Vogel and his part. Yeah, and it's it's um it's exactly how the the Suns need to play, right? Like Kevin Durant, you want him with the ball in his hands. Devin Booker, you just want him to cook. You don't really want to put I don't think guardrails on on Kevin Durant or Devin Booker, but Bradley Beal is a notch below those guys, and I think it's fair to, at this stage of his career to put those guardrails on him. And if he's you know, I, I do you remember when he was coming into the draft out of Florida? Like his his number one comparison was Ray Allen. That was mm-hmm. his number one comp. He never really lived up to that. Um, but late stage career Ray Allen, like coming off the bench for Miami, just shooting threes. I could see that for Bradley Beal in this next phase of his career. This is a guy who used to average thirty points per game. If he's averaging eighteen to twenty a game on efficient shooting, that's a tremendously valuable thing for this Phoenix Suns roster. And so um yeah I, I've liked a lot of what I've seen from Phoenix and it's funny that you made this your second take because I almost texted you that my take for this episode is going to be Lakers slash Phoenix Suns because it's a very similar take that I have is these new coaches are getting the buy-in and it's made me have to th- rethink how I project both of these teams and, and their viability as a team that can come out of the Western Conference let me ask you a follow-up to that that can get us towards the end here because I think it will be more to say in the Suns going forward, and we're, we're running long a little bit here. The three head coaching hires that feel like the best, the, the highest level of success is so far this year, in no order, Kenny Atkinson, J.J. Redick, Mike Budenholzer. All offensive-minded head coaches, I think, and also very detail-oriented head coaches is, is also what I would say. Is there anything to that that is the kind of coach you should be trying to hire in the modern NBA? Is there anything no. to that idea? No. No. Um, I do think being able to coach a good offense is really important, but um, this is sort of the mistake I think that the NFL made is that, hey, let's just go find a guy. I heard it one time. I wish I could cite the source. It was like, if you peed in a urinal next to Sean McVay, you'll probably get a head coaching job. I mean, that, that look, there was a run there where it was like his whole staff was just getting poached. And like, you know, Zach, like Zach Taylor is a great example. It's like he made a Super Bowl and I'm still not sure that guy's a good head coach. You know? Right. And, he and, work with and so I think we, yeah, all that stuff of being able to coach a good offense and the scheme stuff, all that's really important to me. What sets the sets apart the guys who can do scheme and hold the job versus guys who could do scheme and not hold the job is the detail orientation, is the people skills, the leadership skills, um, you know, being respected by those people, finding ways to tap in and motivate your players. Like that stuff, to, that stuff goes way beyond any schemes because at the end of the day, you could just hire somebody to do your schemes. You can't, if you're the head coach, you can't hire somebody to motivate your team. That's the job. That's really the job there is the leadership qualities. And when you are talking about guys like Eric Spolstra, JJ Redick, Mike Boonholzer, like uh, Greg Popovich, like the like guys who have been on their coaching their teams forever. And then these two new guys, I think the thing that those four guys all have in common is they found a way to break through with their players in one way or another. And that to me is the most important thing with these guys. If you can find, if, you, if you're looking for the new head coach, it's not some young hot shot who's developing this cool scheme in the G league necessarily that you're looking for. It's, Hey, does this young hot shot who's developing this cool scheme in the G league is he able to talk to the modern NBA player and get them to buy in? That's sure. the number one question I'm asking. Yeah, no, I think that's entirely valid. Wes, the other thing I will just say about the Suns is I think someone like Mason Plumley. I know that's like the least sexy thing, but he yeah, like Mason helped Plumlee win them a game. Out. Let's go. He he helped the he helped. That's right. We haven't had the siren in a while, and I feel it's well, it's I, very my, my mix board was disconnected the last two podcasts, but that's we're right. back, baby. Yeah, we're we're back. We got this. That's right. He has actually like like been very effective just at like yeah. the little stuff on the court that has like helped them sneak out some games. I, like I tie there's a big Ramona Shelburne story about Tyus Jones and how he's helped everyone feel more comfortable. The numbers do not reflect Tyus Jones being an overly impactful player so far, but like I do think they just have in like O'Neal and Plumlee and even Nurkic at this point in Jones, like they just have more like normal NBA players who are doing normal NBA player things. And that plus Budenholzer just has added just a level of stability with this team that I'm like, oh, right. This is how you support talent. You don't just throw the talent to the deep end and try to shoehorn and everything. You just like play to their strengths and you're you're fine. Like that yeah. feels like a pretty reasonable bet they've made with that. Your job as a coach and as an organization is to acquire your stars and then make the make the job of your stars easier. That's your job. And I thought their, I thought Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, I thought their jobs were tremendously difficult last year for a lot of different reasons. You add a coach with the organizing principles of Mike Boonholzer and a point guard who can help set them up in Tyus Jones. It just makes their job a lot easier. Again, West odds right now. 
Mm. It's open. Mm. You have the Sun in order. Thunder plus 250 to win the West. Mavs plus 550. Timberwolves plus 550. Nuggets are plus 700. Suns plus 1,000. Lakers plus 1,100. Then there's a drop all the way. To, the Grizzlies are still a plus 1,400 right now. Grizzly uh, Warriors are plus 2,000. Everyone else is a bit longer than that. This, I think the odds reflect, Wes, that this is open. And I even just, I think the Thunder, clearly the favorites right now. But I think everyone else, I think I can make a pretty good case that all of them deserve to be in the same group right now. And the teams that have longer odds right now, in particular, the, the Suns and the Lakers, I'd feel better about them right now. And again, it's very early, but I feel better about both those teams right now than I do the Nuggets and the, the teams that are just ahead of them in the standings. It's crazy that we're here. I, and it's five games. Like, this could change sure. in a week. Yep. Yep. But it's like, I've seen the Lakers be awesome, and then I watch the Nuggets have to go to overtime to beat the Brooklyn Nets, you know? Mm-hmm. It's weird times, early season. But uh, the, they tell you they tell you a story. They t- the 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 honest stuff we talked about earlier this week is, is the same vein. It's like sometimes people are telling you what they are. It doesn't have to be a month into the season yeah. for it to matter. No, we know the Lakers and the Suns are better, and we know the Nuggets bench is a problem. And that I, I don't think that stuff changes right now. And there, Wes, busy weekend ahead. Uh, is there a game on the schedule you're most excited about the next couple of days? Is there anything you're looking you're looking forward to before we come back on Monday? Yeah, you know what? I'm actually pretty excited for Magic Cavaliers on Friday night. Are you going to that? I am going to that. Somehow, Wes, despite the fact that I have stepped away from Fear the Sword and locked on to it, I'm like, I don't need to go to every game anymore. Like, I need to have a more normal stability in my life, do the show, and that's it. I'm going to end up having going gone as a fan, but having gone to the first like three home games of the Cavs season. It's so much happened. easier to do it as a fan, though. It really oh, is. Oh, I can go home and go to yeah. sleep. It's Just awesome. I love sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cavs Magic Friday is going to be awesome. Cavs Bucks, even though it's back to back for the Cavs. Um, I think that's another interesting one. And then I. This, the weird one that I'm looking forward to is also on Friday, and that's Celtics Hornets. I've just really liked watching the Charlotte Hornets this year, and Lamelo Ball's just doing wild shit. And the one the hand, Celtics- uh, the one, the one legged three pointer is he's he's really into that lately. No, there's a bunch yeah. of games Friday night. Also, Nuggets Timberwolves. I mean, yeah. you know, those two teams trying to get out of their own way, but also a a rematch of that classic playoff series from last year. So yeah, a lot of great hoops coming up. Uh, Magic Mavs on Sunday as well. Yep. Good stuff. All right, we'll end there. We'll talk to you on Monday. Have hope everyone had a good Halloween. Enjoy the weekend. We'll talk to you come Monday. Have a good one.